One of the hardest issues for me to try to tease out and condense into a generalized argument about Asia was to describe or capture what I call the new Asian values. I identified three sets of values that I think Asians loosely, again loosely, emphasis on loosely, have in common. The first is uh, technocratic governance, right? So even in democracies, and please remember that there are more Asians living in democracies, proper, respectable democracies, than the entire rest of the world put together. So the notion that Asia is simply uh, Chinese authoritarianism writ large is kind of ridiculous. That said, even in the democracies, there is a certain deference, right, again, to executive authority if it has a long-term vision around national inclusive development. If technocratic governance means that even if a society is democratic, you still have a set of issues or mandates that a government is the license to pursue in an independent, sort of apolitical, non-electoral kind of way on a long-term basis. And policies are carried out or strategized by a competent team of civil servants, you know, bureaucrats, that again, are not subject to constant electoral whims. And we see that, again, in the democracies and the non-democracies. If there's a strategic vision, then the societies tend to have the patience and the tolerance and the acceptance and the trust in government to fulfill that mandate and give them more than just two years to do it. And that's what we're starting to see, we've been seeing in Asia. That said, they're not afraid to throw out their governments. Mixed capitalism. Now this is something that is uh, fairly easy to understand because now every country has become mixed capitalist, especially since the financial crisis. We can't truthfully say that the American economy or the British economy are truly laissez-faire free market systems. We have government interven intervention in many forms, uh, whether it is through tax policy, subsidies, um, uh, uh, obviously support and bailouts and these kinds of things. In Asia, of course, that's quite the norm. It's been the norm in Asia's democratic uh, modernizing societies like Japan and South Korea since the 50s and 60s. In fact, it is that strong hand of the state, the MITI of Japan, the cables of Korea, um, that, are, that account for the East Asian economic miracle. China, of course, didn't need to learn those things from Japan and Korea, but it certainly did, right? And so state capitalism is, of course, very much the norm in China. Now, again, even in the democracies, even in a place like India, you have the Made in India campaign, which again is industrial policy. It's the government directing, steering investment into sectors that it determines are going to be the critical growth engines and so forth. So whether it's technology transfer, whether it's subsidies, various kinds of industrial policy, mixed capitalism is the norm. This is, just to emphasize again, a European invention, much more than it is an Asian one, but Asians are very comfortable borrowing this uh, from Europe. So that's the second set of Asian values 2.0. The third is much more diffuse. It's what I call social conservatism. And this is an incremental approach to social liberalism and to the liberal, liberalism in society more broadly. And this can be measured in many ways. It could be press freedom. You already have quite a bit of censorship in Asia. Uh, you don't need a new Asian values to legitimize it, but you can at least start to rationalize why some countries are very cautious about uh, unlimited freedom of speech and uh, in the media or otherwise. And part of it has to do with the very, uh, the very um, sort of uh, fragile and diverse nature and the social complexity of these societies. You know, if you take a place like Indonesia or Singapore or Malaysia, where you have Muslims, you know, and Chinese populations coexisting, people have to be careful what they say, right? So that's one aspect of it. But there's an inter interesting aspect to it that's very novel and, and, and contemporary, which is around technology, particularly the United States, where so much of our wonderful social media, um, you know, sort of uh, innovations come from. These are now being sort of, you know, uh, not discarded, but they're being obviously castigated and, and viewed as uh, social ills. You don't have that view in Asia, of course, uh, where governments have, again, allowed everyone to be on social media platforms, whether it's WeChat in China, or all of them, really. You've got billions of Asians now online and debating and chatting and sharing information. However, Governments have said, look, when it comes to politics, we will not tolerate fake news, right? We're not going to allow foreigners to uh, be able to purchase advertising on our social media platforms, uh, perhaps never and certainly not during elections. We're going to ask these technology companies to install you know, filters and monitors and hire lots of local teams to verify content and immediately take down fake content. So 
again, the adoption of foreign technology and, and improving on it, adapting it, innovating it to your society is quite germane to, to Asia for sure. But here's an example where it makes a lot of sense in the context of incremental, cautious liberal, liberalism in society. And we could go across the board, whether we're talking about LGBT rights or other kinds of you know, death penalty. So I find that, again, whether you're Chinese, Filipino, Russian, Arab, there is this sense that, you know what, the all of freedom is great, but let's make sure that we do it right and we do it in stages and we do it incrementally and we do it in a way that doesn't um, alienate vulnerable segments of the population.